you so much, Father, for your great gift to us because you love us so much. We thank you, Father, for sacrificing everything on our behalf. Lord, help us to remember that, not just during the Christmas holiday, but each and every day, Lord. Help us to love one another in that same way. Help us to treat others better than ourselves, to lift others up above our own interests and our own desires. Help us to be the body of Christ and the light of the world in such a dark time, Lord. And we just thank you so much that you sent us your light. You sent us your love. You sent us your son. And we ask that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Is it on? Oh, now it's on. Wow, I feel like I'm on TV or something. That light is really bright coming right at me. Welcome, you guys, again. I'm so excited you can be here. For those of you who don't know, my name is Sheila Marcus, and I am privileged to get to be the pastor's wife here at this church, which, among other things, means I get to be married to Pastor Joe, which I find pretty fun. Um, So I'm glad you guys could all make it, but I don't know how many of you know that we have five churches, I think, represented here tonight. So, um, Calvary, Calvary North, North. Could you just, this, 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 I don't know, I don't you know you're, you're scattered, scattered around. around. So, so Calvary, Calvary North, North, give a big, give a big clap, clap, stand, stand up, up for, for Calvary North. North. Um, um, Calvary, Calvary East, East Side, side is, is also here. here. Calvary, Calvary New, New Life, Life is here. Is here. And, and is, is, I, always I always get confused, confused. it's either French or Calvary or Calvary French. Calvary French is here from Casterville. Any, anybody, anybody that I missed? Any other Calvaries that are here? Well, yes, guys, but... Oh, guys, there's a few from Grace Calvary here. Um, we're really glad to get the honor to host this this year. Um, I, know, I don't know how many years. Joanne, how many years have you guys been putting on this Christmas dinner? Well, we've actually done it 22 years, but the last few... Right, 22 years. So it's a really awesome thing, and I hope that we can keep it going. Um, from time to time. So we're going to um, talk tonight about being perfected in unity. And I forgot to ask the back, but Jeff, the scriptures we're going to be working on are John 17, 20 through 23. Um, so I'm going to pray before I get started because this always makes me really nervous. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this opportunity to be here with all these ladies. Lord, most, I think, know you and are know we. I know that they're all known by you. And I pray, Father, that as I speak, these would be your words, Lord, that you have a message you want them to hear. And I pray that um, you would just give us hearts um, willing to hear and to apply your word, Lord, and Lord, to just be as you've called us to be, Lord, united in the bond of holiness and peace in your name, Lord. It's your Holy Spirit that gives us the power to walk out this walk, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, I forgot we have words, so this is really good, because I knew none of y'all weren't probably going to have your Bibles with you. So we're going to talk tonight about, um, we're going to, our text is mostly out of John 17, and so I have a few points. First is the prayer, the second is the purpose, and the third is the plan. So the first is the prayer. So John 17, for those of you who may or may not remember, um, is Jesus's prayer. So sometimes we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it's not the Lord's Prayer that we normally think of. It's his prayer before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. These are the last words that are recorded that he spoke before he went there. Um, In the first five verses of the chapter, he spoke to his father about being glorified, that he would glorify the father in verses one through five. In verses 6 through 19, he, talked to, he prayed for his disciples, and he specifically prayed that they would have joy 
that they would be kept from the enemy and that they would be sanctified by the truth, meaning that they, the truth, his word, that they would be separated out for what he'd called them to do by the power of his word. And the last thing, which is the most amazing part, is in verses 20 through 26, Jesus prayed for you and me. So I'm going to, the verses are going to be put up there, but I'm going to read to you verses 20 through 23, because that's our main text for tonight. Um, Verse 20 says, and this is Jesus praying to the Father. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they, may all, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me even as you, I'm sorry, sent me and loved them even as you loved me. So in verse 21, when he's starting, he's talking about these only. I do not ask for these only. And these only he's referring to are his disciples. And so I encourage you, if you haven't read John 17 in a while, pull it out. Um, It's really awesome. So he had been just talking about his disciples, those men who walked on earth with him, who ate with him, who were near him, who watched. They were eyewitnesses to all that Jesus has done. That's who he was saying. I'm not just praying for them, but also for those who who will believe in me through their word, meaning us, you and me. Anybody who's come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ since the time that Christ went to be in heaven with the Father. So... It just blows my mind to think that long before I was ever thought of, Jesus was praying for me, and he was praying for you too. Um, Right before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, this is what he's praying for. And it made me really stop and ponder when I did this to think about if I knew I only had hours left on earth. Let's not even think about I I knew I was going to go through a torturous death. Let's just say I knew I only had a few hours left. What would I be praying for? Who would I be praying for? And what would I be praying? And I don't know. You know, it just made me really ponder. But I do know what Jesus was praying for, right? He was praying that the Father would be glorified in his final acts. He was praying that his disciples would be kept from the evil one and that they would be sanctified and set apart in his word to go and do what God called them to do. And he was praying for us. He was praying that we would be made perfectly one. So specifically, in verse 21, I'm just going to pull these little pieces out. He prayed that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us. Verse 22, that they may be one, even as we are one. And in verse 23, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one. So that's specifically what he prayed. Um, When we read the words about being made perfect, we talked about this a little bit, those of you from Grace at the Women's um, Retreat about um, living loved. We talked about this word, and I know I'm going to say it wrong because I don't speak Greek, but it's like teleio or teleio, and it means to be made perfect into one, perfectly united together with him. So it's talking about bringing completeness in our lives, in him. And that's what he's praying for us, that we'll be united with him together, not just in heaven, but here on earth too, right? Because otherwise he'd have just prayed, just bring them all home with me, Lord, right? But no, he left his disciples here. He left us here and he wants us to be united, but not just united with each other, but united with him. And I, I think it's important to talk about, he's talking about us being united but not uniform. And Pastor Joe talked about this just recently when we were going over this. He's not wanting us to be robots. Or I had to check, I did fact check with my um, grandson. I said, T, what are those guys like in Star Wars and they're all in the white and they all look right? He's like, Star Troopers, Nanny. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's what I mean. We're not to be like Star Troopers. We're not robots, you know. We're united in him, but we're not uniform. We don't all look alike. We don't act alike. We're family, Okay, I just got back from Thanksgiving with my family, and I assure you, if your families, I don't know how your families are, but if they're like mine, we don't all look alike, although we all got a lot of gray hair these days. 
Um, we definitely don't act alike. Um, we don't always have the same opinion about things, but at the end of the day, we're, we not, we're united by blood. I mean, we are either blood sisters, adopted sisters, stepsisters, we're something, but we're united, we're family. Um, and that's the same way that we as his children are. We're all united through his shed blood. We are family, so we're either united under that blood, but we're also adopted into the family. Nobody's getting out of it. And if you think, well, I just got invited in by marriage, doesn't matter, there's a marriage supper of the Lamb. So marriage, adoption, blood, we're all family. You can't get out of it, okay? Um, but God wants us to be united. Um, and so the second part is why, though, the purpose. What is the purpose of him praying that? When you think he could pray anything he wanted to pray for us, but he prayed that. And so the reason he did is also found in those verses. I didn't have to think this one up on my own. Um, verse 21, at the end of it that I didn't talk about earlier, he says, so that the world may believe that you sent me. In verse 23, he says, so the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. So most of you have memorized a verse probably from childhood, John 3, 16. Right? Who can say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah. So he told us that earlier in John, in chapter 3, that God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loves us. You know, he loves you, and that's the reason for this prayer. He wanted us to know and the world to know that the Father loves us. That was part of his mission. So just as he loved Jesus, he loved us. So let that sink in for a few minutes, right? Can you imagine? God the Father, who's one with Jesus, loves you just as much as he loves his son. That's pretty amazing. I don't know, blows my mind to think about that. The following verse right after that, John 3, 17, not everybody memorizes that one, but it says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So again, the focus on these three words, he wanted um, us to believe that he was sent by the father. He wanted us to know that he was sent by the father. And then he also reminded again that he sent, he was sent by God and not to condemn us, but that we might be saved through him. There was a reason. Um, earlier in the chapter, John 17, um, on verse 3, it tells us that, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So these things I kept, as I was going through this, um, and praying about, what am I going to say? What, Lord, what do you want the women to know? The words that just kept popping out to me were that the world knows that the world believes that he was sent. So those things were really important, it seemed to Jesus, because he kept saying them, and not just here, lots of places in John 17. But the words that he used for believe and know isn't a random kind of thing. Those words are talking about knowing in a personal, intimate, beyond a shadow of a doubt kind of way, right? That we need to know and believe that he was sent. And so that's kind of a question I have for you. And it's rhetorical. You don't have to answer it out loud right now. But I do want you to ponder it. Do you believe? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the son of God and that he was sent here by God? Because if you don't, I want to talk to you later because you are missing out on some great joy. Okay? It's important to know this beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is the son of God and that he was sent to this earth. It wasn't random. When we talk about the word sent um, in Greek, it talks about, it's like to order another person, to go to an appointed place. It was purposeful. It's planned. It's not just random, like, ah, oh, Jesus decided I can go anywhere. I think I'll go to earth, right? No, he was sent here for a purpose. Um, and it was always planned that way. And that's the part that always speaks to me every time I think about it. I mean, I used to really believe when I was a young believer and I hadn't spent too much time in the Word. I really thought like Jesus was the backup plan. 
You know, like, it was never planned. Like, we were supposed to all do what we were doing in the Garden of Eden, and we were all supposed to do right. And then because we messed it up, now God had to send Jesus. Like, he had to, like a second thought. That's so not true, lady. Before time began, that was the plan. John 1, 1 through 5 tells us, In the beginning was the Word. I love this. And the Word was God, and the Word, wait, wait. Yeah, was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Galatians 4.4 4 tells us, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. It was always the plan. And when God decided the fullness of time had come, he sent forth his son. Okay, it was in his time. It was always his plan. So this baby that we um, celebrate, the birth of his baby that we celebrate this time of the year, it's part of God's master plan to unite those in the world, those whosoever's, you and me, before we accepted him, with him for eternity. If Jesus was not sent by God into this earth, then he's just another cute baby born 2,000 years ago, right? What does it mean? There's no specific plan, no purpose. But because Jesus was, in fact, sent by the Father as a Savior of the world, and we believe, and we know this to be truth, we are united and part of that plan to reach the world. We are one with the Father and the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And we demonstra- as we demonstrate this unity, the world will know and believe that the Father sent his Son. So just think about this. It's at Christmas. It's really easy to get caught up in, oh, this baby. But he was sent here with the purpose. And we're part of that purpose, right? So the world will know As we're in unity, as our lives are connected with God the Father, the Son, through the Holy Spirit, and we're in unity, the world will know and believe. So it doesn't take much to realize that when we're not connected to the Father and the Son, it's kind of hard for the world to figure that out because we look just like them, right? If we're not walking with the Lord, there's no difference between us and the world. We don't know. So I kind of want, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I will, um, to just tell you how simple this is, this part, our part in this, okay? So some of you have met my friend Gerilyn. <laughs> um, we've been friends for longer than many of you in this room have been alive, okay? We met in high school, my junior year of high school. And um, a couple years later, Gerilyn um, ends up um, coming to know Jesus. She gets saved. And so... Her most heathen friend, um, you know, was a little skeptical, to say the least, about this. And so I had a lot of fun laughing about the little Jesus freak she had become for a little while. Um, But I guess I want you guys to know, that's how simple it is. You know, I saw a change in her life. I saw, she taught me about a relationship with Jesus. And it took me a little while, you know, before... I decided to make the decision for myself, but it wasn't painful, you know. She didn't really have to beat me up or anything. All she had to do is do what this word is saying. She had a change in her life. I saw a change in her life. I saw new purpose. I saw just new focus in her life because she had a relationship with Jesus. So we'd have conversations, many I won't even go into because it's embarrassing what a heathen I was. But... You know, just like I had such this worldly view. And I would say to her, well, well, no, because you guys, this was in the 80s, okay? So some of you weren't born, but, you know, that was women's rights, ERA, and no, I want to do what I want to do, and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and she would just say, yeah, I don't remember all the words, but, you know, she would give me God's perspective on it. It's like, and, and most importantly, what I remember is her saying, you don't need to change all this and get your life fixed, God wants you just the way you are, and you can come to him, and that, like, blew my mind. Because, you know, I figured when I was ready, when I got my life together, and I was willing to give up all these things, 
um, I would come to the Lord. But, you know, it was just her simple testimony telling me, and here we are 100 years later and, you know, still walking with the Lord. But I guess I want to encourage you guys. That's, that's all he's asking us to do is if we keep our relationship right with him and we're in unity with him, this part flows well. When you're out of fellowship with the Lord, don't be thinking this part's going to go well, right? Your marriage, your kids, your dog, everybody is going to be giving you grief. You need to be connected with the Lord to make it all work. So here's God's plan, my summarized version. This is the way I see it. The father sends his son. The son sent the Holy Spirit to live with us when he had to go back. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. The son sends his disciples out, those eyewitnesses. He sent them out into the world. If you don't believe me, go back and read a little bit earlier in John 17. We believed because of their word. And according to Jesus' prayer, we will be united. We will be perfected in one with him so the world will know and believe. And earlier, when Jesus was praying to his father in verses 4 and 5 of John 17, he said, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. It's like mission accomplished, right? I've been there, did that. I've done what you wanted me to do. I want to glorify you and now take me home. I'm ready to come back up and be with you in the glory I had before the world existed. So it kind of goes back. This was always the plan. And it's a whole nother talk to talk about what he gave up to come down here to be with us. It's just, it's mind-blowing to me. So likewise, we're sent out into the world. Like Jesus, we are to accomplish the work that he's given to us, which is to be united. So at Christmas, this time, when we celebrate the birth of the baby, let's not forget that the baby's birth was part of an eternal plan to redeem the world and that we have a part of that plan. We are to become perfectly one with him, to be united as the father and the son are one. And I guess I can't help but add, remember the father said, I have done everything you sent me to do. That obedience is a part of being one with him. There's something he's asking you to do we need to be doing it, right? We need to be in fellowship with him. John 13, 5, 35 says, By this all will know that we are his di- disciples if we have love for one for another. So that's a big one, having love for one for another. Ephesians 4, 3 says, We are to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit in the bond of peace. Remembering that we are all one in Christ Jesus, as it says in Galatians 3.28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So while I did take a minute to point out all the different Calvaries, you do realize we're all one part of one big body, right? So that's just Calvaries. Now let's talk about all the other churches in San Antonio. And then let's talk about all the churches in Texas. And then let's talk about all the ones in the U.S. And the worldwide, we're a part of one body in Christ. And so there is that unity. He draws us all together. And I don't know how many of you have the opportunity to travel um, abroad or another place, but it is the sweetest thing to go maybe to another country. I've had the privilege to do that. They don't even speak English, but to go into church, the Holy Spirit is there. You know, I don't understand, but I understand right? Because I know God's word and you just see that fellowship. You're just loved because you're part of the body. Psalm 133.1, and I'll close with this. Behold how good and pleasant for the brethren to dwell in unity. So I wish that for all of us, especially over this holiday season, that we would really focus on dwelling in unity first in our own home. Well, first with the Lord, right? So if you have some business that you need to do there, you need to get back to reading, you need to get back to praying. If there's a devotion that's got stuffed under the bed somewhere and you can't remember where it is, dig it out. Um, I can't encourage you enough to stay in fellowship with the Lord, stay in his word every day so that you can have that, this relationship going well. And then the rest will fall into place by the power of his spirit. Um, we need to be dwelling in unity together. 
It pleases the Father's heart, and it is what he came to do, and he left us with a job to finish up. Until he calls us home, we're to be dwelling in unity so the world will know that he was sent. Um, and so at Christmas, when you're talking with your coworkers or even your kids, whoever remind them, it's not this cute baby. I mean, I hear it at work all the time. It's happy holidays and everybody, holiday time, we should all be loved. But then I think sometimes the people who are telling me that, they don't know the reason. Like, why? Why is it a time of love? Why is it a time of peace? So it's a golden opportunity to share your faith with other people. And, and maybe they don't believe it, but it's okay to say, well, this is what I believe about Christmas, right? And they can say, yeah, that's a great fairy tale, but whatever, you've done your job. You have shared with them the peace and you've shared with them the gospel, and that's why we're here. So I'm gonna pray, and then we are gonna take communion together. Um, so as I pray, I guess there's some ladies that will come up we, um, I don't know, maybe you guys do it different at churches, so we'll have the bread in one tray, we'll, you'll be served the bread, and then the juice, and if you'll just wait and hold those things, and then we'll take communion together. Got it? It's dark out there, so I can't really see your faces. Okay. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for giving me this opportunity to just share this small word that you've prepared. Lord, I thank you for the hearts of each of the ladies here. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us just knit our hearts together to be one in you. Lord, help us to have a desire and a longing to know more of you so that we can share more of you. Thank you, Lord, for just all the servants that are here tonight. And I pray, Father, as we get ready to receive your, um, the blood and um, the bread and the wine that represent your blood and your um, body, Lord, that we would be... Um, just faithful to ask for your forgiveness if there are things in our lives that we need to take care of. So I pray, Lord, that we would just be, have quiet hearts before you now and um, prepare our hearts to remember you. In Jesus' name, amen.
So um, at the, in the end of the Last Supper, the Lord Jesus said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, the night, Lord Jesus, and the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, and do this in remembrance of me. So let's, Lord, we lift up this bread to you, and we thank you, and we do remember, Lord, while you came as a baby, you lived here all those years with one purpose, Lord, and that was to die, to take away our sins. And we're thankful, Lord, and we remember you this night, the sacrifice of your body for us, Lord. And so I pray that we would just eat this in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink, that in remembrance of me. So, Lord, we have this, this cup before us. And, Lord, we know that it represents your blood that was shed again, that you willingly obeyed your Father for us, Lord, so that we could have eternity with you. So we thank you, Lord. We remember that sacrifice, Lord. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Thank you, ladies. I'm going to ask um, Joanne to come up for just a minute. She has a surprise she wants to share with you. We're not rushing anybody out, but we just want to share this surprise. And then um, you're free to fellowship after that, unless Karina wants to sing for us for another five hours, because I love that. <laughs> you might, is this mic on, Debbie, over here? I don't know how to. Can you guys hear me? Oh, you can use Karina's mic, too. Hi, ladies. Um, we just want to thank Calvary Grace so much for hosting it this year. My ladies and I were sitting over there going, this is wonderful. <laughs> because we didn't have to do all of the work, and there's so much involved in the preparation. So we really, really want to thank the ladies of Grace. Um, we, we have a little gift for you as you go out uh, tonight. It'll be on the back table. And when Sheila and I were uh, meeting together talking about the, the dinner and the plan making and everything, we were talking about, you know, the prayer uh, that Jesus prayed for us and um, just in general, women and women's ministry. And one of the things that's been on both of our hearts and we've really focused on it the past year at Calvary North is that women would get into the Word of God. And when I say get into it, I mean, open up those Bibles and get into it on your own. You know, your foundation obviously is being in church. Sunday mornings is a must. Um, it's wonderful to listen to radio studies, you know, when you're driving around, CDs, all of these different things, but there's nothing, nothing like cracking open your Bible, having a cup of coffee, sitting down with just you and the Lord. Now, I'm not going to put down couples Bible studies or any of that. It's great if your spouse wants to have devotional time, but I'm talking about you and Jesus so that you hear directly from him and not through someone else. You know, in all of the romantic movies like Hallmark Channel and things like that, the guy always says to the girl, I think we need to take it to a deeper level. <laughs> Jesus wants to take you to a deeper level. Jesus' prayer was that you would be sanctified in the truth. Thy word is truth. And the word, obviously, is the Bible. And so many years ago, probably close to 20 years ago, I took a self-confrontation class, a real strong discipleship class. Every week we had to memorize a Bible verse, which was not really easy for me. I know a lot of you will appreciate that. But I don't remember if it was suggested or whose idea, but we got these little spiral-bound books. And every week, we wrote down the verse we had to memorize. And so after, you know, each week we'd add a new page. But the beauty of this is I still have mine in my devotional basket. And what I did once we got done with those verses that we had to memorize is 
I use it to put in a verse when God speaks to me in my own private time. You know how sometimes a verse will leap out at you? One of, it might have been Jay Vernon, but I'm not totally sure. One of the Bible teachers once upon a time said, never discard a conviction. In other words, when God puts something on your heart, don't forget about it. Don't go, oh yeah. So if a verse jumps out at you for some purpose, the idea of these is that you will write it down. And then during your devotional time, or maybe you get stressed about something, you can open this up and just flip through it, and those verses are right there. And it's a very powerful way to remember the things that God has spoken to you. So if your devotional is under the bed, like Sheila said, which has happened to all of us, uh, get a little basket, put your stuff in it. It makes it really fast to do your devotional time and throw one of these in it um, and really use it. And it's to me, it's so comforting to go back and see the verses that the Lord really ministered to my heart at. Um, so anyway, we just wanted to encourage you to do that. The ladies of Grace decorated them and made them really pretty and gave you some starter verses in them. So I hope it'll bless you. So anyway, thank you so much. You can pick one up on the way out. Do you want to do more? We're not rushing. You got to leave. Do you guys have another song for us? Oh, she has a Christmas song for us. Which so we're gonna end with a Christmas song, ladies. Why don't we all stand and do what we do at Calvary East and show some love to your neighbor? All right, let's sing Joy to the World together. <laughs> 